Welcome to Inside the Skev, and I'm your host, Aaron Naslianski. Today, I am delighted to have Patrick Keenan Devlin, and he is from the Moran Center, which is in Evanston, and they do some great work to help with people, um, mainly teens, but we're going to talk about it and talk about restorative justice and what that means and, and why they started. So, Patrick, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what the Moran Center does? Sure. So I always like to start when I talk about the Moran Center about its history. Yeah. So it started in 1976, uh, but its founding story really goes back to the death of a young 19-year-old in our community. His name was John Cox. He had a two-year-old son who was unresponsive one evening. He proceeded to give him CPR, chest compressions, uh, without receiving a response from his child. Calls 911, 911 responds to the scene, and the child is pronounced dead at the scene. His father, John, is arrested for murder. Uh, he's held in custody for days without counsel, without contact with, with his family, and ultimately attempts suicide in an Evanston jail cell. He's then brought to... Evanston Hospital in a coma. Uh, Evanston Hospital lies to his family and says, you can't afford our medical bills. So then transfers, convinces the family to transfer him in a coma to the Cook County Hospital. Cook County Hospital welcomed him with open arms in having a gurney set up to take him right out the back door to the county jail hospital. So after his third transfer, he died. And at the time, Alderman Moran was on the city council and investigated with Northwestern University, the police, the hospital, um, the county, the public defender's office, and ultimately found that there was a equity gap, a justice gap in our community, and that he found about $23,000 in the city budget to start a community-based defense organization. So that's the, that's the core of what we do, is we represent children and young adults up to the age of 26 in criminal and juvenile delinquency proceedings from jail side to litigation. But Alderman Moran and then Jimmy Carter later appointed, appointed him to the bench, uh, so Judge Moran, really believed that as lawyers we needed to have a holistic approach to counseling. And so from the very founding of our organization, we always had social workers working right alongside us because Nobody who enters into the justice system enters in uh, without trauma and without typically complex challenges that they're confronting. And so we've always partnered with social workers. That's the core of what we do. And then everything else that we do really is tied back to that. So we have, for example, an education advocacy program where we as lawyers advocate for kids in school discipline proceedings and in special education proceedings, because we feel that if kids can succeed in school, then we've broken down that school to prison pipeline. So a, preven a prevention tool. We then have a school-based civil legal clinic. And the thought there is if we can help families stabilize by avoiding evictions, by uh, securing public benefits, by appealing public benefit denials, if we can provide that type of stabilization, families will not be ostracized by our community, uh, they will not be entered into broken institutions like our criminal justice system. Uh, and they can stay here where, where we want them to be. Uh, so everything kind of ties back to how can we break down pipelines, the school to prison pipeline, the poverty to prison pipeline, the poverty to institutionalization pipeline to support families and, and children and, and young adults. So that's the core of what we do. How many people do you typically work with um, every year? So we typically work with about 1,400 kids and youth and families every year. That number keeps rising every year. One of our signature programs, which I failed to talk about, is our expungement and sealing help desk, which we operate every Tuesday and Thursday from 10 to noon at the Skokie Courthouse. Uh, and the core of that work is to help people who have criminal backgrounds remediate their criminal records. Uh, and right now, in, in this moment in our country and our world, that's going to be even more critical. We have the highest unemployment rates since the Great Depression. 
And that misdemeanor conviction that you received maybe 20 years ago didn't hold you back from securing employment when you got that last job 10 years ago, five years ago. But in today's market, where it will be probably the most competitive job market in the history of our country, that record will really mean the difference between you getting a job and you not getting a job. So at that help desk, we help about 850 people per year clear their criminal backgrounds. And, and it's, I, it's adults that we help at that uh, help desk, but almost every adult is connected to a child. And so it's still very mission focused that our work is about helping adults and families because if we help adults and families, we're there by helping children. Right. Now, you said that the help desk is actually inside the Skokie Courthouse? Inside the Skokie Courthouse, right outside the clerk's office. So how are you operating now? And, you know, do people have to com communicate with you over Zoom or something like that? It's a great question. So the courts are closed, and they've been closed since March 16th. Uh, and what we've done is we've built out our website to have more information about expungement and sealing. So it's moran-center.org backslash expungement. You can go on that webpage and learn more about the expungement and sealing process in Cook County and the state of Illinois. But we've also partnered with- uh, you know, I think I'll show you, uh, I could share the screen, which is Great. so cool about Zoom. So why don't we show everybody that? Great. If you're listening on audio, uh, I, you know, watch the video. <laughs> so. So you're, you're, we're on the website right here, and you said, it, it, where can we go to find this? So you can either just do backslash expungement, or if you go to how we can help, mm -hmm. under that tab is expungement and sealing help desk. And right there are tons of brochures and information about the expungement and sealing process in Cook County and in Illinois. And we have um, all the information in Spanish as well. That's great. But what I was going to say is that we have also, like many industries, had to rethink how we serve people, uh, given that we're not able to connect face to face. Um, and that's a real challenge in the judicial system. Uh, we're about 20, 30 years behind uh, most industries. I mean, prior to the pandemic, I was still filing carbon copy motions in the circuit court of Cook County. So we have a long way to go in terms of modernizing, but what we've done at the Moran Center, we, there's an amazing organization in Illinois called the Illinois Legal Aid Online. And it is a website that is really consumer focused to help consumers navigate complex legal issues. And as a partner with Aleo, we can uh, answer people's questions through that platform. We can do online intakes through that platform. And then this crisis has prompted Clerk Dorothy Brown to open up her criminal and traffic database online. So as registered attorneys can now access people's records online. Whereas before the crisis, we actually had to physically be in the courthouse to look up a person's record. So now we can do an intake online, we can advise people online. Uh, and we can even look up people's record online and start the petitioning process. Now, the issue is, though, we have to wait for the courts to reopen to file the petition, but yeah. we can get a lot of work done in the meantime uh, so as to grease the wheels from when the courts actually do, in fact, reopen. Does it frustrate you at all that it took a pandemic to be able to modernize where people can at least, you know, you can check this stuff online? I mean, I know in my industry, I'm in real estate, you know, a lot of things that people wouldn't do before because for whatever reason, or even in mental health, you, you couldn't do telehealth because your insurance wouldn't cover it. But now all of a sudden, right. everything's okay. Right. I mean, what gives? I, I do think in the judicial system, we are, the leaders of our judicial system are overly cautious. And I, and I think it's understandable as to why. Um, yeah. You know, for example, in the criminal courts, um, we have, the courts have transitioned to Zoom hearings. Uh, and for efficiency purposes, I can appreciate that, particularly in a pandemic. But when a person's liberty is at stake, that, that is a person-to-person -person hearing, and, and I truly believe should always be a person-to-person -person hearing. I think you lose a lot when, when it is um, put online, I think. And, and I also think there are questions of confidentiality that are uh, at play that uh, are not as easily resolved on an online platform. Uh, but... Circling back to your, your, your point, I do think that there, are, there will be many silver linings to the pandemic. And one is that it has 
force the hand of many leaders in our country, in our state, in our region to rethink how they do things. And, and one way is that lawyers now have access to the criminal and traffic database, which I, I expect will be ongoing access that we have after the pandemic recedes. Um, but I mean, I have to throw myself into that uh, bucket too. I mean, there are ways that we're delivering services that I never thought we would have been able to prior to the pandemic. Um, but I'm very proud that the pandemic has compelled us to be creative, be innovative. Yeah, that's what it's done. It's made people be very creative to be able yes. to accomplish what they need to. One of the things, though, that there is, you know, especially in your line of work, there can be a digital divide, and people may not have access to. Uh, the technology that's needed in order to be able to communicate with you. So have you been working with any organizations to try to get, um, you know, Chromebooks or anything like that? I know like in the district, uh, for the school district, right. they're working to get people technology. Right. So we are incredibly grateful to both District 202 and District 65 that they have unbelievably quickly dispersed technology, Wi-Fi hotspots, Chromebooks, to their client, to their um, students, and to their families, um, and that's actually allowed us to keep in contact with our clients. It's allowed the school districts to uh, implement e-learning fairly quickly. Um, it has also allowed the district to comply with federal law. So, the U.S. Department of Education and the Illinois State Board of Education have been very clear to school districts, locally and nationally, that they are to comply with IDEA requirements, so the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So if you, you have a child with a disability, there are strict timelines for when meetings need to be held, evaluations need to be conducted, um, annual reviews need to be uh, done, and the schools are still bound by those timelines. And, and most of those things require meetings, meetings with parents, and we've had to walk our parents through, our families through, how to access online platforms to participate in those meetings, how to participate in those meetings. But the districts, both the districts have really been incredible at thinking through how to provide access to families in our community. I mean, the, the challenge though is access is one thing, uh, but you know, right before this conference call, Aaron, I was doing kindergarten lessons with my five-year-old. And that's because I have the unbelievable privilege of one, being my own boss, uh, but two, having the flexibility provided by my organization to do that. Uh, I, I am an extremely privileged individual. There are so many families in our community that don't have that luxury. Or if you're an essential worker, uh, you certainly don't have that luxury. Right. Uh, and so I think one, one concern that the Moran Center has uh, is not only the digital divide, but the privilege divide. And that the achievement gap that we've experienced in this country and certainly in our community for decades, if not centuries, I think will really be exacerbated by this crisis. Uh, and, and it's going to be a COVID-19 learning loss, but it's gonna be felt uh, much more within communities that have already been disinvested by this country. Well, absolutely. And I think that the people that are the you know working at grocery stores, meatpacking plants, whatever it may be, are predominantly people who have been disadvantaged. And uh, you know, if people get sick, their whole families get sick, or people don't want to hire people coming into their homes, let's say cleaning services or whatnot. Um, and you know, all different types of service workers, I think that that could potentially exacerbate issues and you know, create the, the propensity for more crime. So it's, it's incredibly important to try to figure out how to bridge this. I, it's, it's a huge task that you have on your hands. And it's almost like your, your organization um, has become so much more important within the past month and a half. I think that's right. You know, for some reason, I, so I was a history major. Yeah. And so for some reason, I'm constantly thinking back to President Johnson's War on Poverty. And when the president rolled out the war on poverty, he ensured that on the front lines of that war were lawyers. <laughs> and it was fairly innovative at the time, led by Sergeant Shriver, that lawyers were an integral part to fighting poverty. Uh, and this nation will recede into a Great Depression, as, as predicted by economists across this country. 
and it will be lawyers on the front lines alongside healthcare workers and homeless prevention stabilization organizations that lead the effort to rebuilding this country to ensure that disinvested families and children gain access to the public benefits that they're due under the law, that if they are denied, they have the access to appeal, that their rights within our educational system are preserved, that liberties within our judicial system uh, are, are protected. It, it really will be lawyers that will be fighting on behalf of families that have been just unbelievably broken by, by this pandemic. Yeah, it's heavy. Yeah, what led you though to, to get into, into this line of uh, work? Were you always an attorney fighting for, um, for people who, who you help now or did you start somewhere else? When I graduated from law school, uh, excuse me, when I graduated from undergrad, I had an unbelievable opportunity. I was a, an AmeriCorps VISTA, uh, which is part of the AmeriCorps program, Volunteers in Service to America. And I served for one year at the Sergeant Shriver National Center on Poverty Law. Maybe that's why I feel so rooted in the war on poverty, because the, the roots of that organization are, are in the war on poverty. Uh, and I did policy work at the Shriver Center, particularly in Medicaid policy. My next job was in Springfield. I was an advocate on behalf of consumers working on predatory lending reforms, campaign finance reforms, et cetera. Uh, and then that work in Springfield compelled me to go to law school uh, because in Springfield, the people who were really leading the policy discussions were lawyers. Um, so I always intended to go back into consumer rights. And then I stumbled on the Moran Center during law school and the executive director at the time uh, recruited me to come work for the Moran Center one summer as a law clerk because she said, I think you'll really enjoy working for children and, and young people. And she was right. I loved it. And thankfully, when I graduated, there was a job opening. And so I took the job and that was about eight years ago. And then about four years ago, I became the executive director of the Moran Center. So I've, al I've always been in the anti-poverty movement in our country. Uh, and, and I do see the work of the Moran Center as part, as, as part of that larger movement. Yeah. Um, but particularly our job is to dismantle these in pipelines of injustice that are just so entrenched within our country and our community. Do you think it's possible to, to, to fully accomplish that? Yes, I do. It, it is incredible that Congress in the past month, month and a half, month and a half, has invested $2.1 trillion back into the economy. They can no longer say that they cannot find the money to end homelessness. <laughs> they can no longer say that they can't find the money to provide universal health care. They, 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 they have lost the ability to say that because in a few days, they somehow found $2.1 trillion and they keep on finding trillions of dollars to pump back into the economy. So yeah, I do think it is possible. Um, you know, I, I, I know uh, last week or maybe a week before you, you interviewed Nia Tevralaris from yes. Connections for Homeless. What that organization has done with smart investments uh, and, and investments from state, federal and, and local levels and individual donors, they've ended homelessness in our community. Uh, and, and it's incredible. I mean, it really is. It's incredible. Yes. And, but what we have to do and what, uh, in supporting organizations like Connections for the Homeless is making sure that it's not just short term. You know, how horrible would it be that we end homelessness in Evanston for a month and then we let it go back to where it was before? That's what and I that wonder. would be a shame. And, and, yeah. I, and I think a, a moral wrong. And, and so I'm really excited. But, yeah. But, it, Look, we found two point one trillion dollars in the federal budget. I think it is. I think it is possible. I really do. What do you, What do you think about you know being a history um, buff and especially in, in, in this line? Um, why didn't the war on poverty end poverty? I mean, Johnson spent a, a lot of money at that time too to try to reinvest and to try to fix these problems. There's a lot of political reasons why the war on poverty uh, did not accomplish its, its intended goal. 
Uh, but look, it accomplished a lot of its goals. I mean, yeah. strengthened Social Security. We got Medicaid, Medicaid and Medicare. Um, we, we got the Legal Services Corporation, the Peace Corps, AmeriCorps. I mean, so much of our social safety net is owed to that war on poverty. Um, but we can't stop there. And, and Johnson, when he rolled out the war on poverty, had a vision for universal health care. Uh, and he couldn't achieve it. And so we got Medicare. I mean, do not, uh, to quote Senator Kennedy, do not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, we, we can keep making progress. I think uh, the Affordable Care Act is an example of progress that we've made in this country. But, but we can still go further. Do you think it's, I mean, we, you also talk about, you know, you're saying how we, we were able to spend $2.1 trillion in the blink of an eye, really. Um, and Andrew Yang was talking a lot about when he was campaigning about universal basic income. And, uh, you know, now, okay, so every family has gotten money from the government. We're talking about potentially yep. it being on a monthly basis. Jan Schakowsky was talking about. I mean, it's incredible how things can change, how, how change is so fast nowadays, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, will that help people? Well, to quote Rahm Emanuel, who I rarely quote, <laughs> never let a crisis go to waste. I mean, I, I think that this is an opportunity for those of us who have been on the front lines of ending poverty and fighting poverty and um, creating innovative, inventive solutions, policy solutions to the table, like our Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky. This is a time to act. This is a time to be bold. Um, Again, our, our Congress, in a blink of an eye, invested $2.1 trillion in our country. Uh, so this is a time to say, look, you can find $2.1 trillion. You can fund universal health care. You can fund food security for this country. You can then require and, and set uh, you know, basic standards for industry as to what a living wage is. We, we can do this as a country. Yeah. And yeah, we can. And then, you know, you talk about restorative justice. What, what does that mean, restorative justice? Is that everything that you're doing with social workers and, you know, all, everything together? It's a great question. So restorative justice is a new pillar of the Moran Center's services. And we started the Roger Pascal Restorative Justice Initiative, named after one of our founding board members uh, about two years ago. Uh, and, I, and I came to restorative justice uh, through an organization in back of the yards called Precious Blood Ministries. Uh, and I, I was really taken by the concept and the principles, which are fairly basic. You know, it's, it's that you are, um, if you are a person who believes in restorative practices and principles and values, that you are a radically welcoming individual. You are radically hospitable, that you are willing to listen and potentially radically forgive. Um, and in learning about the practices and principles, I realized this is what's missing within the Moran Center's scope of programming. You know, we, we are constantly in crisis mode, right? Ensuring that kids are getting what they need in school, ensuring that children are not locked up, um, making sure that families aren't denied food stamps. Uh, making sure businesses are hiring people with criminal records. We're, we're, we're constantly plugging holes in, in the dam. And what restorative justice does and forces you to do is look at systems and say, how can we as a society, as a community, address problems more holistically, um, more radically, and, and really focus on what harm is being caused and how can we repair the harm? And its roots are in victim offender uh, mediation, right? You punch me, we sit down in a circle and we mediate that, that harm that you cause and I as the victim get to say to you, Aaron, this is what I need to be made whole. But you can quickly see that that type of conversation can be held at a systems level. And so the thought is if we can build not only personal one-to-one -one relationships in our community, like with you and me, Aaron, that is restorative and that's just rooted in these principles, that we can do the same in our schools, in our hospitals, 
in our government. So I'll give you a quick example. We worked with the city over the past two years to codify into city code a whole bunch of misdemeanors. And you might go, why would an organization that is justice oriented want to codify you know, crimes in the city code? Well, this was the idea that we wanted to give officers another tool in their toolbox to instead of arresting people to be able to cite them mm -hmm. so as to pull them out of the circuit court of Cook County and keep them here at home and hopefully address the harm in a less punitive way. So for adults, let's say you uh, committed retail theft in downtown Evanston. A police officer could cite you for that offense and you as an adult would go to the Civic Center, the Rain Morton Civic Center, and your case would be adjudicated there. So you wouldn't have an arrest, you wouldn't have a criminal conviction, you wouldn't have anything that you would need to expunge. It wouldn't appear on your permanent background. Now let's say, Aaron, you were 16 years old and you were arrested for the same crime. You also go to the Civic Center, but instead of being adjudicated, you actually enter into a restorative process where social workers from the city meet with you as a kid and your family and attempt to figure out what it is you need. What, you know, why did you do that? Uh, and, and what can you do to make up for it, to repair that harm? And what can we do as a community? Because we've obviously failed you in some way, shape or form. So what can we do to help you? Uh, and if you meet all of the terms of that re repair of harm agreement is what it's called, nothing happens. There's no fine, there's no fee, there's no you know, ridiculous, usually ancillary community service hours. It's really about meaningful uh, repair. So that's just one way the Marin Center has worked to build restorative justice within government and the police department. I have, I have two questions to follow up with you on that. One sure. is, why aren't we doing that for adults as well? And the second is, what if it's a violent crime? Yes. So violent crimes are, we, we were successful in codifying uh, two violent, violent crimes. One is a battery and one is an assault. Um, they are misdemeanor offenses. We have not removed discretion from police officers, though. So it's really still on police officers to make the determination whether this is an offense that is meriting um, you know, a second chance and, and having that off ramp to the Civic Center, uh, as opposed to, again, the Circuit Court of Cook County. Um, so discretion is still uh, within, the, um, within the hands of the officer that responds to the incident. Uh, in terms of why can't we do this for adults, I really hope we can. But I, I think that it was an easier sell to say, let's start with kids. Let's, let's show that it works, uh, first and foremost. And then my goal, and everyone in the city knows that this is my goal, so I'm not sharing any secret, is to then raise the, the, the age from 18 to 26, which has been proven to be actually the, the point of maturation. Uh, let's do that. And then if that's successful, my hope is to raise it to 96. Um, so that's the, that's the ultimate. If you're 97, you're screwed. <laughs> yes. Yes. Sorry, you shouldn't be committing retail theft at 97. <laughs> Uh, give him a pass at that point. <laughs> <laughs> I think I hope I hope we would. To be yeah, honest, I really do. You've done your part in life. <laughs> um, so you've got you've got a lot going on here. How do you? How many people do you have working for you? Because it sounds like you have fourteen hundred people that you have through your doors every year. So that's that's a lot of work. We have sixteen staff. Uh, I know this off the top of my head because I submitted a grant yesterday. We have it comes to 13.225 full-time equivalent empl employees okay. um, that, that work tirelessly. We have uh, six attorneys, including myself, and then the rest include social workers, three social workers, administrative staff, and development professionals that, that really are critical of keeping the lights on. Yeah. Um, so that, that's the full makeup of the Moran Center. Are you guys hiring right now? I mean, or no. a very tight, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It will be an extremely tight budget next year. And, and what I have said to our philanthropic partners and our donors is my, my hope is to really tow, tow the line and tow our expenses and keep them in line and in check so as we can keep everybody on staff. Um, I don't expect us to be able to grow uh, next year, or potentially even in the coming years. But I think it is critical that we maintain the staff that we have now because inevitably, 
when the courts reopen, we will be inundated by demand. I mean, the uh, the, the governor's eviction order will be um, lifted. Oh yeah. At the end of this month, so landlords who have been itching to file eviction petitions will be allowed to do so. Uh, so there will be a deluge of eviction complaints that will be entering into the circuit That's court. Scary. People who have applied for unemployment benefits right about now are probably receiving either their uh, acceptance or denial. So those denial applicants, those denied applicants will need representation in the administrative and potentially at the court level. Um, so I'm just expecting all of the uh, challenges, the legal challenges that we have heard about in the news and that we can just infer from, from walking on the streets of our community and in our country that these will be the issues that people will be facing and they'll need lawyers. Oh, they will. It's scary to think about all the evictions and then, you know, possible foreclosures and things like that. Right. I hope people can get people to work. I really do. But it's scary because we don't have a vaccine yet. That's right. That's right. And I'll just plug, you know, I love Connections for the Homeless. Um, they, they have, they've done such an unbelievable job in um, caring for our community and, and housing those who are really, really vulnerable right now, including many of my clients and many of my families. Um, and one of, the, one of the advocacy points that Connections is focusing on is there's a bill in Springfield uh, that gives consumers uh, some level of forgiveness as to rent and mortgage payments. Uh, I know that negotiations are ongoing as to what will make it into the final bill, so it's unclear as to what will make it in the final bill, but I would keep your eye on Connections for the Homeless's uh, advocacy page for what consumers can do to advocate in Springfield. Yeah, they are doing amazing work. When I yeah. saw that they got everybody off the streets in, in Evanston, I said, I've got to get a hold of them. And I saw Nia was quoted in, in an article. I immediately reached out to her. And they, I mean, it's just, it's amazing what you can do when you have to. And, and right. just, and I, I think that donors who support these organizations, your organization relies on donors. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So how can people support you guys? I mean, is it on the website where they can donate? Yes. So we have a donate link in the top right-hand corner. I'll show everybody, everybody again. Uh, and also, when you're showing everybody our website, you'll actually see a teal banner on the, there it is. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have a virtual event coming up on May 21st. It's a Thursday evening at 7.30. Um, we had, like everybody, uh, planned for an in-person event, but we are going virtual. I also feel incredibly, incredibly fortunate, Aaron, about our honorees for this year, because they are very used to uh, operating in a virtual world. Uh, so Ear Hustle, which is a podcast that is produced from San Quentin Prison that really talks about uh, and gives voice to men uh, who are incarcerated in San Quentin will be our honorees this year. And then Jen White of WBEZ will be interviewing um, Nigel Poor and Erlon Woods from Ear Hustle. This is actually a big week also for both Ear Hustle and Jen White. Ear Hustle was named as a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And then Jen White was just uh, announced, was just named as the nationally syndicated host of 1A <laughs> in Washington, DC. So they both had huge weeks. So I think it makes this event even more exciting for people to participate in. You guys have got incredible people to have as part of this. That's amazing. I gotta sign up. Yes, we, we and we had a lot of dumb luck this year. So <laughs> no uh, kidding. Very, very, very grateful. Very grateful. Well, at least we had some good things happen. Um, yes. And then the donate button is right up here. Uh, yes, sir. So easy to get to, and you know you have uh, you know matching gifts right now. So if you can, please, please help um, Moran Center. Uh, to continue to support the work that you're doing. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Do you exactly. feel, you're welcome. You know, you've got such a background and uh, you're doing such great work. Do you have, uh, do you think that you're doing as like affecting the world in such an incredible way or do you have other aspirations for, you know, you have a great background for politics. Um, well, I, I, no, this is not, <laughs> this is not about me, but I will say that, um, the Moran Center, so our restorative justice coordinator, Pam Citrenbaum, every week does circles at Connections for the Homeless. 
because that staff really needs to be made whole. Yeah. <laughs> no more, probably more so than anybody, right? Uh, what trauma they're experiencing, witnessing. Uh, and what Pam has walked away after, what, what she's walked away from, the main takeaway she's walked away from those circles is that every frontline provider, every social service provider that she comes in contact with at Connections says, I'm not doing enough. I want to do more. I, you know, I, I, I need to be doing more. And I think that's a universal truth. I think it's, a univer it's certainly a universal truth for me. It's a universal truth for my staff. When I sit in circle with my staff, everybody always complains about themselves and how they're not doing enough. Um, and I think that is a sign of, of a helper, is that helpers feel that they are never doing enough. So, but I, I actually think that is somewhat true, that you know, the Marin Center can always be doing more. We can, all of us can always be doing more because uh, there's always more to do. There is always more to do. The work never, <laughs> never, never goes ahead. away. It never goes away. Never goes away. But I, I, I think that you guys are doing incredible things. And, you Thanks. know, I wish, I wish that we didn't need you. Uh, it, I, wish not I wish we didn't either. I wish we didn't either. I wish we didn't And, you know, I say that all the time. If, if, if an organization is, a nonprofit organization is in this work uh, simply to keep itself afloat, then it's really missing the mark. I mean, every nonprofit should have a goal of getting out of business. Mm -hmm. And the prevention work that we do, uh, you know, our school-based civil legal clinic, our education advocacy program, and even the reentry work that we focus on with our expunged and sealing help desk, that is all there so as we can get out of business. Uh, and, 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 and tied to that, if my hope is that Moran Center can be more engaged in policy work too in the coming years because often policymakers and policy advocates uh, are removed from frontline service. And I think we have the advantage of being able to say, well, I saw this up close. I saw this injustice up, up close and it can be fixed by just changing that semicolon, right? I mean, sometimes policy can be that easy. Now the lift is always hard. Um, but I, I really do think that the Moran Center has its focus in the right place, that it is about getting out of business altogether. Yeah, no, I think it's it's great. And, and the work that you could do with the schools and, you know, changing how things are, how discipline works even there. I know uh, it, that is a key to getting everybody to change how they feel and how they, how they you know, self-evaluate themselves. And when people constantly think that they're the bad kid, um, it, it becomes the prophecy becomes reality. So I think that it's it's so helpful to to do this work and to continue to um, change the way we think. Yeah. Well, I'll just end by saying it sounds like we're landing that plane. I'll just say that a core principle at the Marine Center is no child is bad. All children want to do well. All children want to please. Uh, and if a child does fail, it's it's our fault. It's the adult's fault. It's the system's fault. It's society's fault. And um, as lawyers, social workers, and believers in restorative justice, uh, I, I really do hope we get to change the narrative in our country about children and families. Uh, that is a great message. So let's hope that we can do that. And everyone, just to, to learn more, go to moran-center.org. And uh, Patrick, thank you so much for being on the show. We appreciate it and continue doing what you're doing. Thanks, Aaron. You're welcome.